again. Welcome you to our subject, Know Your Bible. And this is the desire of every pastor that you would know the Bible. You know, we try and study the Bible. <laughs> and this particular Bible that I've had only about four years is now disintegrated. So I've got to start studying in a new one. But uh, I do practice what I preach. And uh, knowing a Bible, so very important indeed. We have come now in our studies to the last but one book in the Bible. And it's written by the Apostle Jude. The Apostle Jude was the uh, brother of the Apostle James, who wrote an earlier epistle. And he was a half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, we are going to look at this excellent, but very small, epistle that Jude wrote. And uh, he starts off, you know, by saying, you know... Beloved, give all diligence, give all diligence to contending for the faith, contending for the faith. And uh, what is the faith? Well, basically, it's the Apostles' Doctrine. And what was the Apostles' Doctrine? Well, it was faith in Christ for salvation, water baptism that we are buried with Christ, we rise afresh to walk in newness of life with him, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are baptized with the Holy Spirit, and we speak with other tongues and have other spiritual gifts. That basically was the Apostles' Doctrine. And uh, the Apostle Jude is saying, now I want you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once committed unto the saints. And uh, then, as with all the other apostles, you know, he becomes very concerned for those that have entered into the congregations and are teaching false doctrines. And who are these people? We said before who they are. There are people who once knew the ways of God, but have turned aside, turned aside uh, into lusts, into covetousness, and the like. And so the Apostle Jude warns us of these people. You know, what you are, you desire others to be. And uh, if you're off the path, you seek to draw others off the path. Well, he then gives appropriate warning, you know, concerning these people. And he said, look, God who knows the end from the beginning knows, of course, those who are going to turn aside He knows those that truly trust in him, but he knows those who are given the opportunity and the opportunities of eternal life, and they might receive the assurance, but then they turn aside. He said, the end of those people, the end of those people is eternal fire. And then he goes on, says, look, I want to stir up your memory. And um, he said, you know, concerning the previous generations, those who came out of Egypt, those who came out of Egypt, he said, they came out. The Lord saved them. But they rebelled against God. So what happened? They died in the wilderness. 
We must never forget, you know, that if we use the goodness of God, you know, for our own benefits and think that, you know, because God has blessed us, that it doesn't matter what we do afterwards, he will still bless us and love us. We are making a great mistake. And so, you know, Jude says, now look, all those people who came out of Egypt experienced salvation, experienced many wonderful things and blessings from God, but because they rebelled, they all perished in the wilderness. And then uh, he turns to the fact of the former creation. He said, the angels, you know, who rebelled with Satan, who kept not their first estate. You know, God has reserved in chains for the day of judgment. And we must contemplate these things because having once started is not the guarantee that we shall finish well. We have to apply ourselves and we have to realize this, that once having been blessed of God does not guarantee that we shall finish the race. But we have to walk in obedience to God day by day. Well, then he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, these men who practiced fornication and perfect, you know, homosexuality, I mean, they were destroyed by terrible fire. Again, we come to this thought of fire. You know, scientists tell us that in the midst of this earth, there is a molten mass of fire of thousands of degrees centigrade. You know, we have proof of that. When there's a volcano that erupts, you know, fire comes forth. Fire comes forth. You know, I was flying the day that Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington State. Flying down to Oregon from, I think I was Canada, and we passed by that fiery mass that came forth from that mountain. It erupted. Wherever there is an eruption, a volcanic eruption, there is always molten lava that burns everything in its path. That's a proof that in the center of the earth there is this molten mass of fire. Well, why do I speak of the center of the earth? Because the word of God speaks of hell beneath. Hell is in the center of the earth. And the word of God speaks of the lake of fire. And in this case, you know, fire even came down upon Sodom and Gomorrah and burnt them all up. Well, where did the inhabitants go? They went down into hell, into the lake of fire because of their homosexuality and their fornication. Well, you know, he speaks of these false teachers, those who've left the way, as being filthy dreamers. You know, just meditating on the lusts of the flesh. And uh, then he speaks of the fact, you know, that they speak evil of dignitaries. You know, when a person is evil, they're corrupt. And their very attitudes towards those in authority are evil. Well, he then gives a very outstanding, if I could say this, revelation of what happened to Moses. Now Moses, the great leader 
who brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, you know, was so great that at the end of his life, after having lived 120 years, his vision was undimmed. He was strong as in the days of his youth. And God said, well, you cannot enter the promised land. But I'm going to show you the promised land. And so he took him up to Mount Pisgah and there he could see, as it were, the whole land of Israel, the pleasant land. And then God said, I'm going to take you. And furthermore, God himself buried Moses. And so no one knew where Moses' grave was. But God needed Moses for his purposes, especially in the transfiguration scene where Moses and Elijah communicated with Christ concerning, you know, their lives and how God had spared them, given them grace, and were speaking of his decease. And they were encouraging him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, in between the time that Moses was buried by God and the Mount of Transfiguration, you see, the body of Moses had to be brought up again. And Michael, the archangel, was sent by God to recover the body of Moses. And there, Satan, knowing, you know, the ministry of Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration, and as we shall see in the book of Revelation, that Moses would indeed come again in Jerusalem before with Elijah before the coming of the Lord. You know, Satan wanted to prevent this. And so Satan stood between the body of Moses and Michael. And the point that Jude wants to bring out is this, that Michael did not bring any railing accusations against Satan, but simply said, the Lord rebuke thee. And of course, Michael got the body and it was taken up to heaven. But uh, that's a type of the resurrection, <laughs> incidentally. When the Lord returns, you know, we who will have died, you know, our bodies will be raised again when he comes. Well, he goes on about these terrible people who have left the ways of righteousness and who speak evil of uh, the things that are right. And then he continues by saying in verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and run greedily after the error of Balaam for a reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Let's have a quick look at those three people, shall we? Cain, who was a murderer. Balaam, here he was, a prophet of God. But his ministry could not save him because, you see, he was covetous. And when the prince of Moab offered him much money to curse Israel when his heart wanted to accept and God permitted him to. Well, Balaam, you know, gave counsel to the prince, Balak, the prince of Moab, you know, how to get God to be angry with his people. And he said, well, look, you send young women down into the camp, they'll commit fornication and God will punish in death with the people who do so. And of course, because of that, God was wroth with Balaam. And when the children of Israel entered into the promised land, they sought out Balaam, they killed him. Korah was one who indeed rose up against the anointed leadership of Moses. And how dangerous it is to 
for anybody to rise up against the pastor. He has been appointed by God, and um, you don't touch him. Even if perhaps he has gone astray, let God do it. You know, there's a classic example with David. You know, David was the anointed of God. Saul had been put in the position of being the monarch or king of Israel. And Saul was in disobedience. But David dare not touch Saul. It was left for God to take vengeance upon Saul. You know, vengeance belongeth to me. I will repay, saith the Lord. And so, you know, when someone goes astray or someone rises up against us, let God deal with them. He will. And so it was with Korah, you see. He rose up against Moses, and it was God who intervened, opened up the earth. There were three principal leaders of 250 leaders with their families who rose up, you know, the choice ones of Israel who rose up against Moses and Aaron. And what happened? You know, Moses and Aaron fell before the Lord, and the Lord dealt with Korah, Abiram, and Dathan, and their families, 250 princes. And the earth opened up, and they went down into the pit. And Jude is reminding us, you know, these awesome judgments that came upon these people who once knew the truth and turned from it. And these are all warnings to us. And so now he is going to look at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an event that was prophesied even before the flood. Enoch, the one who walked with God, who pleased God, and God took him. You know, Enoch was a prophet. In fact, as you study carefully the word of God, you will find that the flood was known by those patriarchs hundreds of years before it took place. It wasn't just Noah who knew No. All those patriarchs knew about the flood. But they also knew about the wondrous things that are going to happen in our days. And Enoch, this great prophet of God, you know, he prophesied concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, for us who are Christians, oh, what a joy it will be when the Lord returns and all the violence and all the those who have hated Christians you know gathered against Jerusalem he will slay with his sword and the carnage will be so great that the prophet Ezekiel tells us it will take seven years to bury the multitude that come against Jerusalem for God will slay everyone that comes against Jerusalem. And so Enoch had foreseen this. And Enoch speaks of the second coming, that the Lord will come. He will come with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly concerning their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches. Oh yes, righteousness will prevail. I know that in our days we're seeing violence on every hand and you know the violence, the wicked seem to be able to hide but not from God. You know, God laughs in the heavens and sees that their day will come. Their day will come. And of course, he knows the eternal judgment that is to be meted out for them. The terrors of hell. 
You know, so many of these wicked people, they say, oh, we love death. Oh, yes, until they die. And then their tune alters considerably when they see the torments that await the wicked in hell below. Oh, beloved, don't think that the wicked are going to get away with things. They murder, they torture, they commit atrocities, and seemingly they are not found. But oh yes, God has allotted them a certain time, and they won't pass the allotted time of God's judgment. They say, oh, we love death, we're not afraid to die. Oh no until they die and then they see who is going to meet them you know I want to tell you a story so that you realize the awesomeness of hell there was a young man who was Christian but then left the pathway of life and he had a dream he had a dream that He was riding on a white horse and riding to a banquet. And he got to that banquet and then through drunkenness someone got up with a machete and hacked off his head. And as he did so, two demons came and took him down into hell. You know, as he was dreaming this he was crying out this is not real this is not real it's a dream and uh, the Lord appeared and said yes it is a dream it is a dream but it is a warning of that which is going to take place well he woke up from this dream he told his mother whose mother was godly and pleaded with him to repent but He said, oh, it was just a dream. Well, about midday, just a little after, he stole the white horse of his pastor, went down into the forest to this banquet that was going to be held there. And he participated in this banquet. And the people got very drunk. And one rose up with a machete. Well... You can imagine the end. Hacked off this young man's head. And where is that young man today? Down in hell. Oh no. I tell you this. Judgment comes for the wicked. And uh, so Jude continues. And... uh, He said, yes, there will be those mockers in the last day that will say, well, where is his coming? Where is his coming? Nothing has changed. But what will be the end of the matter? The Lord will surely come. And all those who have mocked and scoffed at the thought of his second coming shall be in fear as they realize the torment that awaits them down below. So we end on a very positive note, you see, because Jude is writing, obviously, to the Christians. And he said, Beloved, build up yourselves, you know, in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, knowing these things, knowing these things that are coming upon the earth, we want to be prepared. We want to be walking with God. We want to seek the Lord for purity and holiness. And we want to be ready to meet him. You see, when we see the wicked on every side, you know, and seemingly triumphing, We must not lose our faith. 
But in reality, we must realize that the things that have been spoken of by the holy prophets and by the apostles, by the Lord himself, shall surely come to pass. The Lord spoke eloquently and fervently concerning his second coming. We need to be ready. And so, here it is. He said, keep yourselves in the love of God. You know, this thought of being kept It's not the question of, you know, coming into the love of God, but being kept in the love of God so that we are preserved. You know, the Lord spoke of the fact that he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. It's the end of life that counts. So he said, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. For the Christian, it is a tremendous joy, the thought of his second coming. But for the wicked, it should be fraught with fear. And so here is the promise that we are going to finish on. You see, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy unto him be glory forevermore. You know, the Lord knoweth those that trust in him and those that trust in him shall be kept by him and presented unto the Father faultless and blameless with great joy. And this is our desire for each and every one of you that you be presented by the Lord unto the Father with purity, blamelessness, and with great joy. God bless you.